So for those who are unfamiliar, the problem we work on is semantic segmentation. Semantic segmentation is essentially a pixel-wise classification that is done on the image. This is a very challenging problem with a wide array of applications in robotics, uh, commerce, autonomous driving, and more. So a lot of people actually ask me when I'm working on this problem, isn't, aren't, aren't like segmentation networks already good enough? So the answer to that is that uh, existing segmentation networks are definitely good, but they can definitely be also better. So the two main categories of failure cases that we will focus on is a loss of detail at high distances and also noisy boundaries. So on the left image, we see that objects at higher distances, like the poles in the background, the smaller objects like traffic lights and poles suffer greatly. Uh, this is not good because for applications like autonomous driving especially, we need to be able to see stuff at high distances to safely stop, especially at higher speeds. On the right image, we see that the network, even with fine labels, uh, a fine label uh, ground truth, fails to predict accurate boundaries. This is especially apparently in small classes like traffic lights and orange, um, traffic lights in orange and poles in gray. Uh, even for the easy classes like cars, you can see that the boundaries actually seem a bit unstable. For the traffic lights, you can't really even tell that those are actually traffic lights just based on the shapes that they have. So why exactly do these problems exist? Shouldn't these mega networks basically be able to learn these uh, things? So one of the problems that these networks have is that they significantly overfit the texture. Uh, according to a study done at a conference paper at iClear, they basically discovered that while humans are really good at determining the class of objects based on their shapes, neural networks are not. For an example, in this image of a cat, uh, humans are able to tell that the picture on the right is still a picture of a cat, just with a different texture. Meanwhile, the neural network completely fails in this experiment and it instead actually performs better at humans at classifying textures. Consequently, most of our segmentation models are initialized with something like ImageNet and likely suffer the same type of uh, issues. This explains why segmentation networks fail at higher distances because farther away and smaller objects rely more on shape rather than texture because the textures get sophisticated at low resolutions as it goes farther away. Another problem that these uh, state-of-the-art networks has is that they downsample the images heavily. Uh, for these uh, segmentation networks to make accurate predictions, it needs to increase the spatial receptive field of the convolutions to capture larger portions of the image. This is particularly important for large objects in the image. By downsampling the image, the effective receptive field increases without having to increase the size of convolutions, which would take more memory and compute. Uh, some negative side effects of this is that high resolution details are lost. This should be at least part of the reason why farther away objects tend to perform worse, just because the textures become obfuscated with downsampling and that the boundaries are noisy because the boundaries are kind of lost in the downsampling process. There are tricks to mitigate this, but eventually not enough. And post-processing methods exist to improve this kind of stuff, but they are definitely slow. So basically what this tells us is that we need higher resolution features for image segmentation. So to summarize, we came up with two solutions to solve this issue. First, we want to focus on shape. And second, we also want to focus on uh, high using high resolution features. So we'll go ahead and make something that does both. Uh, so this is what a typical Deep Lab V3 Plus architecture, which is one of the state of the art architectures and segmentation, looks like. Uh, it has a cascading feature extractor, which then gets fed into a multi-scale feature extractor, the ASVP, and that's it. We propose that we basically add another branch to this network to for and force that branch of the network to process shapes, using edge detection or boundary detection as a proxy for shape processing. We can fuse those features with the regular features for our spinal segmentation. And this is our proposed architecture. And basically, we use uh, what we call gating mechanisms to facilitate the cooperation between the regular branch and the newly added shape branch, such that uh, that outputs the uh, boundary segment, uh, that outputs the boundaries. These gates help to ke uh, keep the shape stream lightweight because it takes a lot of the features from the regular branch. And we can go ahead and take a look at what these gates look like. So these gates basically learn to focus on certain features. For an example, we see that gate 1 highlights the relatively low level edges that include the edges on textures, whereas gate 2 focuses more a little bit more on the high level boundaries. We can see here that our network does le learn shapes through the boundaries, and the boundaries seem consistent and clean even for smaller objects farther away in distance, as well as thin objects like poles. These high resolution and high density feature maps help to guide our network to produce segmentation maps with better boundaries. 
Let's also take a look at the actual boundary outputs. So we can see here that the we can see here the actual boundary outputs and the edges actually seem very stable even temporarily and looks very nice even for hard object classes like bikes and poles. And you can especially see that on poles because even even across frames. So now that we have boundary outputs, how do we actually use them to better guide our segmentation network? So we propose what we call a dual task loss, which enforces consistency between the two representations we learned in our two stream network. We can then look at our resulting segmentation mass, which is the result of fusing the two branches. So the dual task loss consists of two different loss terms, which is enforces bidirectional consistency. Uh, I don't want to focus too much on the specifics here, but I just wanted to in include this in case anybody is curious about the actual formulation. I also added a key here just to make the variables and corresponding representations a little bit more clear. So our first dual task loss term consists of taking a spatial derivative of both the ground truth boundaries and the segmentation mass boundaries, which we then constrain using the absolute loss term. And for our second dual task loss term consists of taking the standard cost entropy loss term on segmentation and adding more weighting on the pixels where we have a high boundary confidence. We basically just do this by using a simple indicated function with thresholds or boundary output. And these loss terms help to produce our final outputs here. Uh, we can see here that the final output of the segmentation mass as well as the corresponding edges for those, uh, these segmentation mass. And it's kind of hard to see on this projector, but hopefully you can see that the boundaries look a little bit more cleaner than they were before. We're comparing this with any other thing that we've seen before, or, or the comparison? Is with this one's specifically with our, our work. This is all our work, yeah. Just different video frames that we show the edges and also the segmentation of. And these edges here are produced from the segmentation mass that we actually produce. So here's another area of visualization of our methods. Uh, wherever it's not black is basically where the network makes a misclassification. We can see that our network significantly improves on areas that dflat v3 plus makes, especially on borders. So you can see an example for like the, I guess like the third from the left one, you can see some people walking. Yeah, I think there's some people. Yeah, and you can see that the, you can see that the, the areas on the people actually decrease, especially on the boundaries. So how do we actually do quantitatively? We identify two problems, so we also propose two different metrics for our two problems. So for high distances, we propose what we call a crop mean intersection over union, which is actually just an intersection over union on the segmentation mass calculated at different crop distances. The higher, the farther away in the image. And this works particularly well for as a metric for distance in our case, because in our outdoor scenes, typically the I guess like the center of the image corresponds to farther away objects. Uh, here we can see that in the strictest regime at 400 crop, we get close to a 6% upgrade in mean intersection over union. We can also see that the quality of mass for dplat v3 plus decreases at a much faster rate than, uh, than in ours with distance. So we can see that our network is more robustly distance than compared to dplat v3 plus. Second, we also have the boundary evaluation. So we compute this by first converting our semantic segmentation predictions to an edge map, and then comparing against ground truth edges by using precision over recall per class. We also evaluate this at different thresholds, which gives different slack in the evaluation process. So we see here at the strictest regime at three pixels, we get close to a 4% upgrade. This also means that our boundaries are in fact much better aligned than VPLAB. And so we covered our two, both, uh, two main metrics, but we don't want to forget about our main metric, which is just the primary metric, which is uh, mean intersection over union on the segment, actual segmentation mass. And we see here that even in our uh, classical evaluation scheme, we get close to a 2% upgrade in mean intersection over union on the city's case validation set. And that pretty much covers our work. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks.